Welcome back to the panel discussion, Delivering the Digital Government Mission, sponsored by Avaya Government Solutions on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. I'm your moderator, Jason Miller. Our guests today are Adrian Gardner, the Chief Information Officer for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Harry Lee, a Senior Computer Scientist for Infrastructure at the Census Bureau, Greg Pelton, the Chief Technology Officer for Avaya Government Solutions, and Chuck Riddle, the CIO at the Government Printing Office. Now, gentlemen, before break, we were talking, just starting to get into terms and conditions of contracting. And I know, Adrian, that you were saying that when you deal with surge, a lot of that deals with the T's and C's, which is so important when it comes to the cloud. I could tell you guys great stories about certain agencies who we won't name who made mistakes with T's and C's and now are paying big money for it. So let me talk to talk, start with Greg, put you on the spot a little bit. When you start having those conversations with your customers about terms and conditions, what kind of trends are you seeing? What are they asking for? What are you able to, to, to respond with? Well, there's a, there's a couple of aspects that are interesting. One is the commercial piece. And um, it, it's actually a challenge to, to do business with the government because of things like one-year restrictions on contracts. So when you make a big investment in infrastructure and you stand it up, you have to have that, that kind of trust and, and that relationship that you're comfortable that your customer is going to keep buying after that one year or, or you're going to lose a lot of money. And, and obviously, when you deploy a new service, there's a, there's a lot of investment on both sides in that. So it, it's pretty likely that we'll continue if it's successful. So if the contracting piece is, is figured out, Honoring SLAs is, is really interesting. I think it's a new area for a lot of us. Um, we specialize in real-time services, things like voice and, and video applications, where it's not just a matter of, is your website up? It's, is my voice uh, conversation flawless for the duration, independent of where people are? And so being able to tune and manage the network to ensure that quality of experience, whether it's voice, whether it's video, is, is pretty important. So um, it starts, for us, it starts with, with having the technology that can support that kind of capabilities, but then the service providers and the others who are involved managing the network properly. So you have to have very good network managing tools, and you have to have, you have, to have contracts, and you have to have, have conditions that ensure that the network is going to deliver the availability and the performance that you expect. So I think we're, we're kind of in the early, early days, and no one knows how to write these contracts. There's no standard template. A lot of the old <clears throat> um, Centrex managed services kind of kind of uh, relationships give you some guidance, but because cloud is is different and deployment models are different, we're still figuring this out as an industry. And, and, and many times, customers, as you're dealing with customers, they're bringing different problems, different needs. So again, the template doesn't necessarily work. But how does that compare to a managed service or, or something that you guys have done for years? Was there a template for that, or because it was done for years, people are just more comfortable? Because it was done for years, people are comfortable, and because the offerings were pretty standardized, um, put phones on desks and give people dial tone and be able to connect you know, is, is a pretty simple set of services. When you talk about collaboration and unified communications where you've got, you've got voice and video and instant message and presence and, and web share and things like that, it's a rich set of applications that all have different characteristics. And now it's not just one set of infrastructure it's sitting in one location, you know, ideally on the customer site. Part of it's on the customer site, part of it's off you know, in different places around the, the, the United States. So that's more complex to put together and more, more complex to get the offering exactly right. Um, I think we've, we've got some good experience with that. Uh, a lot of, there have been examples of managed services where they have um, been off-prem. You know, and, and, and in a dedicated data center, but, but not on the customer site. So that, that experience helps a lot. Um, but it is, it is in flux, and you know, a lot of our customers have, um, don't want to give up all the infrastructure they've currently got. So you're kind of in a, in a hybrid situation where part of the stuff is still on site, part's in the cloud, and it's all got to work together. Yeah, it, it, it's complicated stuff. We were having a conversation before we got started with Chuck because they had just moved to the cloud with email. And I said, did you, you know, have a, a, a funeral for the servers? Right. So you guys are kind of in the situation that Greg described where you have some on-premises and some off-premises. That's right. So how are you dealing with the SLAs and the, and the terms and conditions? I, I guess the easiest way to put it is it's a work in progress. This is something new for us. And I think we're, we're not so much focused on, on hammering out you know, the, the SLAs to too great of an extent right now versus just really understanding um, roles and responsibilities responsibilities on who's responsible for what and just making sure that that's documented, whether or not it's contractually documented or not, knowing who to call when something breaks and how to get to support and changing that from when you can just walk down the hall and tap somebody on the shoulder and say, hey, fix this. It's a different mindset altogether when, hey, fix this is somebody off long away from the uh, from the corporation. So it's it's just a different mindset that we're, we're adapting to, I'd say. 
And let me turn to Harry from Census. You guys are, are in the cloud, but with FedRAMP and other changes, it, you, it's causing you guys to maybe relook at your terms and conditions, your SLAs. Give me a sense of what you're doing around that path. Uh, a couple things. Uh, the first thing we, we've done working with Department of Commerce is we've looked at all of our existing contracts with cloud service providers um, and looked at what was there and what wasn't there. Um, and and a go forward strategy working with our acquisition division is we're identifying what we want to have in our contracts and our service level agreements going forward. The challenge is simplicity. Um, we really want to make it as simple as possible to manage and monitor the services that we're getting. So some of the things we're looking at is clarity of roles and responsibilities um, because you know we are responsible in addition to the service provider providing that service. Uh, performance measures and guarantees. Um, method to monitor and verif verify service levels, as I mentioned. I have a list here, so don't forget. Uh, agreement on scheduled service outages. They're, the cloud provider, hopefully, if it's 100% if it's, uh, uptime or not, but there might be some planned service outages we need to deal with. Penalties and try to avoid credits. Credits are kind of uh, difficult to manage. <laughs> um, an SLA modification process, things change, especially if you have peaks in your services. You might need to change your SLAs over time, depend on the business that you're in. Uh, and lastly, change management. Um, the, we might change the way we do things internally, and the service provider might change the way they do things, so good change management. So there's a lot of things, lessons we've learned. Um, but again, across commerce and really across the government, we're trying to look at what good SLA should be built into these these contracts. So there's one, one, Adrian, real quick, but Harry, one thing I didn't hear you say, and maybe you just didn't mention it, is data ownership. Data ownership, uh, the ability to uh, transport that data if we decide to change service providers, the cleansing of that data, and the protection of that data. There's a lot of those security controls that I didn't mention, the more contractual terms and SLAs. But uh, Okay, so we'll make sure... Again, I can tell you the story, but we'll, we'll do it offline about the, the agency that, that are paying for their own data. Yeah, that was the exact point I was going to make. So the, the thing that was missing for me was data. I mean, great list, but, but how are you actually going to transition from one cloud service provider to another? And how are you going to get your data back? And what does that mean? Um, the other part of it is, is looking at um, the visibility of the way that they're monitoring the service from a security standpoint and what they will allow you to actually look at. So if I really say I, I want to go in and kick the tires on your security posture all the way down to looking at the way in which you're monitoring your logs, so on and so forth, are you going to allow me to do that in real time? And so there's a number of challenges in that aspect. The other thing is it's just simply, as, you, as a lot has been mentioned here as far as roles and responsibilities, but I think also not only roles and responsibility between the service provider and, and actually the, the, the person buying that, that service, but also from the standpoint of the roles and responsibilities for if something bad happens, how do you actually, um, so in other words, if there is a spill, how do I actually negate that from a standpoint of it being in the cloud? What does that look like? What, is that, what does that framework look like? How, how, what, is, what is the level of engagement with law enforcement if that's, a, if that's, that's required? How do you actually posture and manage your way through that? Look at that. He's only been at FEMA for a year. He's already using the terminology if there's a spill. At NASA, he would have said something like if there was a hack, if there was a launch. Uh, Greg, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I'm, I'm, Adrian, I'm just curious. Um, so FedRAMP compliance is, is sort of the baseline now for, for security. Uh, do you feel that, that FedRAMP is good enough and, and if, if someone is certified at that level that you can use the service or is there still a set of, of SLAs you're going to go and, and interrogate before you're willing to buy the service? I, I think it's a mix. I think we'd use them, but I, but I would still want to kick the tires, personally. Um, FedRAMP, I think, gets us to, a, to a, a good place, but I need to be in a better place, in my opinion, just given a number of the security challenges that the government has as a whole. So I really need, um, you know, when I was over at NASA and we had some discussions with a couple of the cloud service providers, you know, they were unwilling to open up their and, and really convey what their, their, their security posture was, how they were maintaining that, how they were managing that. That was their secret sauce, if you will. And so I think we've got to get to a point where there is an equal trust on if I'm really going to buy the service from you, I really need to have visibility into it. I, FedRAMP provides some of that for us, but I really believe as you begin to tailor it down to then what the actual agency needs, there are going to be puts and takes. If it's something that's low and I really don't really uh, have no concern about, about it, the risk of exposure, 
I may just go ahead and say, okay, the Fred Ramp certification is good enough and we're good. If it's something that's moderate or high that I'm really um, concerned about from a standpoint of it being a mission application, I may want to take a, a deeper dive. You opened the door to security, Greg, so let's let's walk right through it for a second. Uh, FedRAMP compliance, first of all, we're going to assume Avaya is either there or very close to being there. Were you Are you finding that customers are demanding it? Because there is that, the, the, the mandate went into place, I think, starting in June, that all all cloud services had to be fed ramped, which I love making the noun into a verb. In, in general, um, every customer asks about fed ramp, and um, <clears throat> we, we are we are well on the path. We're FISMA moderate, and, and we're in the middle of fed ramp uh, compliance right now. So it, it is kind of a baseline. And I was curious what Adrian thought of it because, uh, from industry's perspective, we'd like to say, all right, you're certified, you're good to go. Like like when you're certified with the uh, with the JIDIC and in the DoD, you can sell products to everywhere, and, and there's there's no real restrictions. But I don't feel that that's the case, and, and most customers feel like Adrian that, okay, this is this is a starting point for security discussion, not an endpoint. And and the challenge for for industry and the challenge for our customers is that um, if that if there's still a very long uh, process before you can you can turn a network up, it, it's not like going to Amazon or it's not like going to Verizon and buying a service where you click a button on a website. It's actually a, is a, there's a very long incubation period before a service is deployed and scales. And that makes it difficult to capture the value quickly and makes it difficult to have the budget impact quickly. So I think we haven't found a good, a good uh, quick path to that yet, but maybe it'll, it'll come with, with more experience and more trust. Yeah, and, Adrian. And I, and I would respond by saying that, you know, it, it, if, if the process, if, if both partners are willing, the process can actually go pretty quickly. You know, but, it's a, it's, but there's a lot of back and forth that happens that I think if we cut all that out and we just had a very straightforward conversation about where we're going to go and where we need to go, I think you, you could actually do that in a very streamlined way and actually stay on schedule. So I think it's all about the way in which we characterize security too as an impediment. It's, I really want in security to, to be an enabler and using FedRAMP to me is a part of that enablement. But then we need to start, as you said, it's a starting point. We have the discussion then, and, and I really need to look at it from a data perspective on how sensitive is that data, right? And then I think we begin the discussion there and start working there. So starting with your FIPS 199 all the way through the process, right, where we're saying we're characterizing the sensitivity of the data, what is it, how does it impact our business, so on and so forth. And then we begin the discussion. If, we're, if both parties are having sort of a, a very robust and honest conversation, I think we can get there pretty quickly. Let me just open up to the panel, maybe to, to Harry and, and Chuck as well. When you talk about security and you talk about cloud, FedRAMP, is that the 80% solution and there's still that 20% for, for many things? Or is, is FedRAMP only a 50% solution? And, and because, as Adrian said, I still want to kick the tires, that's the other 50%? Uh, uh, Chuck, I know you don't really have to, you, your FedRAMP does not apply to the legislative branch, but I'm sure you guys are still paying very close attention to it. Yeah, it, it's sort of a, a minimum baseline, if you will, and, and, it, and it's definitely not a one-size-fits-all sort of thing. So it really depends on the nature of the application you're moving as to whether or not FedRAMP is 50% or 80% good enough to get you there. So it, it's, it, it really depends. I, I hate to answer it that way, but it really depends on the nature of what you're trying to move as to whether or not it really fits well enough to let you do it without a lot of uh, additional uh, SLAs and, and, and additional kicking the tires to make sure that you add those extra things in. So can I put you on the spot or on email? Sure. Was it 50%? Was it 80%? Were you closer? I'd say it was on the higher end for yeah. email because w we had the benefit, you know, of, of standing on the shoulders of the agencies that went first. So I think for that, for a commodity like email, it was a lot easier than it might be for something that we plan to take out to the cloud in the future. So a mission critical app where right. obviously if it fails, if you get hacked or you have a spill, it will, uh, that's right. a lot more serious than email, which you, you, you well, e make the balance out. Yeah. Email is important, but, but the good thing is, is that it, it's, it's, there's a lot of tried and true, uh, commodity-based uh, aspects to email, so it's it's not as unique as, as other things that the agencies provide. Harry, just your input on, on your insight on, on FedRAMP. Obviously, 50%, 80% depends on the apps, like what, what kind of what Chuck said. Yeah, it's what security controls you might need in, in addition to what FedRAMP provides. I think FedRAMP does a great job, and I think it continues to mature. Uh, I think GSA's done a very good job there. Uh, with our email, uh, we have a, what we call a risk management framework that any system that gets deployed anywhere we take do a security assessment around that, and we mapped that framework to FedRAMP and to our uh, cloud email, 
and uh, we were very high, very high. A couple of other controls we wanted to see put in place. So again, sensitivity of the data, uh, working with our policy and privacy office, make sure they feel comfortable. Our title data that and there's providers provide us that data. <coughs> Excuse me, they need to be protected as well. Um, so yeah, but I think Federum does a great job, but again, it is depends on the security sensitivity of the data that you're really trying to work with. And I think FedRAMP was never actually put out there to say this is the be all end all. I think uh, OMB and, and the, the Joint Authorization Board, DHS, DOD, GSA all understood that this would be at least a starting point. But I, was, I think that they were hopeful that was the 80% solution versus the, in some cases, 50% solution. Well, Adrian, let me just tie this back around to you. When you guys are going down the path of cloud and, and mm -hmm. start to look at cloud vendors, what are you looking for from them in terms of the security piece? You talked about uh, what happens if there's a spill, roles and responsibilities. Yep. Is there another piece to that? I, I mean, I, I think it's just you know, just a willing partner, I would say. You know, the, the ability to really, uh, for them to understand sort of uh, the, the perspective of where we, um, you know, our security posture, our, our security appetite, if you will, and matching up then their their sort of openness with uh, the way in which they're managing their the service uh, with that the, with that appetite. So as long as there is a right sort of organizational fit um, between the service provider and, and FEMA, I think that's where, where we where we start. And we've we've had that with the the couple of uh, vendors that we've worked with thus far. And I, and I believe you know we had that at the be very beginning in the inception of the initiation of the project where we had security in. We started that discussion early, and security was embedded throughout that entire process. And so I think if you do it that way, then you're not. It's sort of it's less of a gotcha. And, and so we really have been training our folks, the security folks, because they have to look at this, at this service very differently than they have on-premise and, and servers and, and desktops and the like, where now you really have to actually get embedded with how are they actually managing this service, how do they then tune the, the security practices to meet that goal. And so I think that's what we're doing right now is really saying, is there somebody that actually aligns with, what, with sort of our philosophy on security? And who's leading this effort? Is it the, you are as the CIO, or is your chief information security officer or even their infrastructure guy yeah it's actually girl? it's actually a combination of, of the chief information security officer and actually our program so because we want to make sure that our program officials are actually heavily engaged in that discussion because we have to understand the business of the IT and the how the IT is going to enable their mission it's really a dialogue between the CISO the program official and then also the cloud service provider all right you Give me a great way, a great time to take a break, and we're going to come back. We're going to talk about those business owners, folks, and how they get involved in cloud. You're listening to the panel discussion, Delivering the Digital Government Mission on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM, sponsored by Avaya Government Solutions.